Life in the midst of a viral pandemic has not been easy at times. In fact, it's been difficult, uh, albeit a bit strange. But among these weird times, there have been some moments of real joy and an opportunity to connect and sort of just reflect on what's really most important to all of us. Um, today is going to be one of those moments, I suspect, a moment when we can all come together, have something to celebrate and not to sound too cheesy, but I think in many occasions that is each other. Whiskey has been an amazing catalyst for connectivity well before the pandemic happened. But I think the combination of YouTube here on this platform and, and really just coming together has been phenomenal. And I think among the ashes of everything that's been taking place, it's been a bit of a Phoenix whiskey. So uh, today, is, as you can tell, it, it is a special day. If, if my sort of intro did not um, make that clear enough, as we have a very special guest and actually not only one special guest today, we have two. Um, I'll bring out the first one. The second one, of course, you know, it's quite frankly written in the description here. But uh, the first one is a, I should say, a rising star here in the uh, YouTube community. He is, pre after previously swearing off all forms of social media and refusing to be in front of a camera, he is a bit of a cult following on his own. And his name is... Tom Smith. Wow. Tom Smith. <laughs> I mean, what what Tom an introduction, Smith. man! That's that's amazing. Thank you. you're you're very kind. Um, no. as much of a liar as you may be, you're very kind. Tom Except Smith. for the social media part. I, yeah, I'm not. I'm, I don't hate it. I just never did it. You know, and it was a lazy thing first, and then it was just like, well, it's too late now. So, but anyway, hey, you know, nothing nothing wrong with hopping on board now. So. Lee Armstrong, thank you so much. Thanks for having you look, me. You look great in sunny New York with yeah. pineapples on your shirt or whatever that these is. Are, uh, these are actually uh, palm trees. Uh, I figure, you know, I, I've watched a few of these um, broadcasts and I feel like there's a lot of solid denim on the uh, Society uh, USA YouTube channel. So I thought that uh, maybe I could spruce it up. Now, now, mind you, this is one of the more conservative shirts I have in my closet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I hop on again, um, then maybe I'll, I'll get a bit louder uh, just to eh, have a little fun, drink some good whiskey, you know. Yeah. Life's short, man. We got to drink up. So it's, as Tom, as you all know, you know, my friend and colleague here and um, yeah, I like, I like the setup. You know, Tom and Tom has more and more people are asking for Tom on screen. We want Tom. We want Tom. And so uh, we thought, what sure. better person to have with us? Tom, you know, before we introduce our, our next guest, and I think it's no surprise who it is, Tom, you spent some time with him a lot a lot of time last year in, as you together traveled across the U.S. hosting a series of tasting events for our members. Um, maybe before he's out here, what was that like for you? Was, was that I, I mean, you know, there, there's always a little bit of uh, anxiety when you've you've read so much and heard so much about this this icon of industry, um, and and you know I I certainly had been in in touch with Charlie and and uh, you know we had corresponded quite a bit, but there's always just that oh man am I going to screw this up somehow you know, <laughs> but, yeah. but like listen the moment I I greeted him at JFK Airport to the moment I saw him off at LAX I mean. It was it was nothing but you know just an amazing experience and and to be in the presence of of someone with that wealth of knowledge is is really amazing. I mean, I, I seriously learned more in a car ride from New York to D.C. than I learned in 20 years in the wine and, and spirits industry about Scotch whiskey. So you know, it, it's it was an absolute pleasure to. Uh, sort of shepherd him and, and and just kind of make sure he was getting from point A to point B in a timely fashion. And, uh, and, and also just to sit back at the events that we hosted with members and just see the awe that people had and the regard that they held him in. It, it was really special. You know, it really was. It was one of those wonderful moments for, for, you know, member connections uh, that, that aren't always so easy in the U S since we don't have the, the members venues. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to bring him on in a moment, but I have to say, I quite like having him backstage. We can see him. He's muted. We can just roast him all day long and he can't react and he can't contest himself. This I'm actually enjoying this moment, but um, 
No, I, I just want to say, first of all, thank you, everybody who's watching. Yes, it is a special day. Not only do we have a, a special guest, Charlie McLean, with us, uh, uh, someone who has really become the face of Scotch whiskey, I think. Um, I, I was explaining to him, I, I quite frankly don't know that I would be here if it weren't for YouTube. I learned so much about whiskey on YouTube. And many of the videos that I think taught me the most um, were uh, that of with, with Charlie, kind of you know offering his own insight and, and knowledge, which has been fantastic. And so, um, Anyway, I, I don't think we should tease him any longer. I don't think we should tease you any longer. We have, we're gonna try to do this in an hour. It is, it is quite an honor to have him. And without further ado, uh, Charlie hey. McLean. <laughs> what was that for you, Charlie? <laughs> I what, see you back what, 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 a, what an introduction. Thank you so much. I'm very, great to very see you, much. Charlie. It's, it's great to be with you. It really is, it's great to be with you. And, you know, like you, Tom, I, mean, I have a kind of aversion. I'm not, I'm not very good on the social media. I don't do Twitter, for example, and the. Uh, um, but the uh, but we had such fun, and you looked after me so well in the U.S. on my last tour um, last year. It was great. It really was, and we had terrific conversations in the car and at the various tastings that we that we did. So it was. Um, so hi to you all. It's great. Great to be with you. Great to be with you. Yeah. So how are things for you, Charlie? I mean, how, how have the past few months been? What, do, what have you been doing? Obviously, I, I see a lot of books behind you. Have you been reading? Have you? Yeah, this is, my, these, this is, this is my, my research material. These are all whiskey books, would you believe? Okay. The, uh, well, these are all whiskey bottles, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I know. Cool. <laughs> I wish I had the whiskey bottles rather than the books, actually. The, the, uh, but no, I, it's, been, it's, been, it's been a very fruitful time because I've written four books um, since the lockdown. Um, these were well. One was commissioned um, early last year, and its 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 title is um, a history of whiskey in a hundred objects. And um, I did nothing about it. I was traveling so much last last year. I was twenty seven times abroad, um, um, and sometimes for for long long periods. And I I hadn't even thought I agreed to do the book earlier in the year, but. Um, I'd done nothing about it. Uh, indeed, I tried to get out of it um, come about this time, July last year. And I said, look, get somebody else to do this book because I can't do it. And they said, oh, no, no, we've got to get you. We've got to get you. And I said, well, why don't get Gavin Smith? Because he's a really good writer and a good friend. And um, he would do it. I know he'd do a good job. And they, oh, no, we've got to have you. We've got to have you. So they said, what about, w would you work with Gavin? And we'll give you an extra year to deliver. Um, and I said, well, I'd love to work with Gavin. Um, and I mean, obviously I couldn't turn that down. But then comes this lockdown, brilliant. So the, the, uh, the first couple of months of lockdown, uh, we, it, was, it, was just, it was just great. So, I mean, with all this resource behind me, um, you know, right, researching, historical research I, is, is what I adore. Um, and the, um, so that was in the bag. We didn't have to deliver till the end of August. That we've delivered already, and um, that's all done. And then there were there were two. Do you know Mahesh Patel? The the um, he's based in in um, where is he based? Las Vegas, I think. Las Vegas, yeah. Yeah. And the uh, anyway, he's 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 got a, a very very rare cask, a final bottling of Karuzawa, Japanese whiskey, um, and so he asked me to to write a little book to accompany the these. No doubt, no doubt, eye-wateringly expensive bottles, which will be released in due course. Um, and I, I really don't know very much about Japanese whiskey, so that was another week's work of researching Japanese whiskey and Kurosawa in particular. And um, I'm, he, I'm, I'm da daily waiting for for a sample to write tasting notes about. And then there was a, another little book to accompany an, an eye-wateringly expensive. Um, a bottling of 1948 um, uh, Ben Grant. Um, so there again, you know, historical research to, to do this. And then the fourth one was actually an update. Some of you may be aware of a thing called the, um, it's got the rather pretentious title of the Whiskey Masters. Whiskey Masters, uh, where are they based in, in, in uh, there's US, um, but they, they, they offer diplomas for um, uh, in whiskey training, uh, U.S. whiskey um, 
I'm not exactly sure what, but I, I believe they're based in San Francisco. The, yeah, the council. I think, they are. I think yeah. they're in California, certainly. And the uh, anyway, my a book that I wrote 25 years ago um, called Malt Whiskey was their set text for the the Malt Whiskey segment of this um, course. And uh, of course, the 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 the, 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 the publishers it was, it was out of print. So um, so then they wanted an electronic version. So I didn't rewrite the thing, but edited it and made sure, it, well, 25 years is quite a long time ago, and the, so I made sure that I hadn't shot myself in the foot, got it wrong, went through the entire text, and then, of course, brought it up to date. Um, so that was another, if you like, labor of love. So I've been kept busy, and the um, and in the meantime, doing tastings, I'm, I'm forever being asked to, to uh, write tasting notes by brand owners or... Um, of I don't know, one, one thing or another, competitions and so on. So I've been, kept, I've been kept busy. And writing is a solitary pursuit. So, you know, being locked down, as it were, the, um, hey, plus ça change, you know, the, the uh, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, by and large, working for myself um, all the time. The, the only difference is that I'm not traveling, but I'm quite happy not to travel, quite frankly, because I loathe, I loathe airports. I don't mind the flying, but I loathe airports. In the, uh... So that's been me the last few, few few months. It's been fine. Well, Charlie, a lot of comments are coming in about your library. It's riveting, um, says the Mossy Muse. And the and question is, do you need a research assistant? Because I think oh, there's yeah. a material here and there. Uh, yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of uh, envy, I think, of the, your books. And um, it, it is quite interesting that the title of your book was Malt Whiskey. I mean, I think you've... Uh, you were essentially you were effectively the what we call the OG, um, the original when when your book is titled Malt Whiskey. You know <laughs> that, that is uh, as original as it gets. So really, really admirable. Um, yeah. So so to, I guess you, you know first of all I, I just want to briefly welcome everybody. I know I've been I've been watching the comments. We want to maximize our time with Charlie, but uh, I don't know Matthew Ryan is here. Good to see you. Uh, Gregor's in the house. Um, oh, so I know Gregor. I'm wearing your shoes. Gregor is a shoe designer for Adidas. And hey, cool. Your shoes. So, yeah, Gregor, all good. And if you're wondering about my foot comfort lately, it's been, you know, ten out of ten. Hey Ben, uh, is it is it really pronounced Adidas? Adidas, yeah. Well, wow. Adidas, I, the, the founder. I've lived thirty three years calling it Adidas. Yeah, but in the U.S. we call it. That's oh, like, it's wow. A, you know, Adidas is. A, yeah, I would say Adidas. 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 Right. Adidas, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Gregor, if, if either of us are wrong, you can clarify. But no, I just, just want to shout out there. Um, yeah, Tom R is in the house, of course. Good to see you back. And Adam, a lot of the usual suspects, uh, none more than the memorable Pickley Do. Good to see you, Pickley Do. Uh, anyway, so we have a you know we have a full agenda. Obviously, as you can tell by the title, we have a whiskey to talk about. But but maybe first, Charlie, Charlie while we have you, you know, as the chair of the society's tasting panel, could you just briefly? Briefly, just explain. You know, what is your role? What does that entail? Um, I think a lot of society members here in the U.S. are really fascinated by the concept of the tasting panel, but not much is discussed of it. And last year, when you were over uh, traveling the U.S. And, and meeting with members, I think a lot of members sh shared with me that they love just hearing from you how how it works. So maybe would you be able to just touching on the process and your involvement? Yeah, uh, yeah. Happy to. Happy to. Um, I, I did a formal training in what's politely called sensory evaluation, the sensory evaluation of potable spirits in 1992, um, when I was working on, where I, I had finished my first book um, about Scotch. Um, although having done the course, I then had to rewrite all my tasting notes because the, but that was a real life changer. Um, and on the course was a friend of mine who um, um, called Richard Gordon, and who, who uh, he was. A, he used to work for Glenmorangie in the eighties, and um, he 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 had recently been. I think he was still working for Glenmorangie at that time, as a matter of fact. But he went on to be called, become the managing director of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Um, and he brought me onto the panel to chair the panel and to brace it up because the 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 tasting notes were pretty random um although they were very entertaining and my brief was to 
to to encourage the panel to um, to be more accurate, but but yet retain the the kind of entertaining, um, you know, gloves off, um, no pejoratives sort of thing. I mean, there there are no there are no pejoratives. So if, if you smell smelly socks, the the you 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 put it down, you know. And smelly socks are not necessarily in certain whiskies a bad thing, um, funnily enough. Um, so, so I became the chair of the the panel. Um, there, there, there are usually about half a dozen people sit on the panel. Um, it's grown and grown since then, obviously. And the um, so now there are four. I think I think four chairs, and I don't do do it regularly. I mean, this was a, a, a weekly job. You know, once a week I would I would um, go to the vaults and. Um, and they would have, have we would have a, 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 a session. Um, the way we go about it is quite simple. The 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 we look at the we look at the appearance of the whiskey, which is that might be a chance to start on the on the the, the whiskey that you've got in front of you. Shall we shall we shall we do it together? Oh, sure. So, I so, thought I'd have to wait fifteen more minutes to to, to get the whiskey <laughs> up. So we look at the color, and um, they come to us. Sometimes they put them up blind, and sometimes we know a little bit more about w w what they are. We generally, um, we've experimented with doing it completely blind, not knowing what the whiskey is um, or anything about it, you know, strength or age. Um, um, but by and large, the, it's, it, we, we found that it's, it's best to know what it is. It sets up expectations, um, and of course, members will 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 also set up expectations, because nowadays you can you can although they're all numbered, the you can find out what the what the whiskey is. That's correct, isn't it, Tom? Because the um, yeah, yeah. Um, you can go online if you don't if you don't. The codes, the codes are out there. I mean, we yeah. we we try not to mention distilleries, but you know. Members know that the codes are available, and yeah, and after a, a few weeks, you, you're, you're probably memorizing some of your favorites anyway. It's yeah, it's human nature for sure. We we all want to know more, you know, but it's the, fun to have the, that the, bit of mystery as well. Yeah, the numbering system was was done out of courtesy to the industry because, as you can imagine, the brand owners, um, they're very, and especially we're, we're, we're going back. Well, so the, the society was established in what eighty two, I think, wasn't it? And the uh, eighty three, uh, yep, eighty three was it? And the um, but they were very nervous and suspicious of independent bottlers, for the simple reason that they do not have quality control, and um, so out of courtesy, the Pip Hills, who who was the principal founder, um, he decided that they they, they wouldn't reveal. Um, the name of the distillery, so it was down to the, the the members relied upon the tasting notes, and they made the made their own judgments. Um, and so, of course, each bottle has got the, the the number of the distillery, and then the number of the the cask. The, 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 so, one one was Glen Farkless. Yeah, and that's a story about Glen Farkless because John Grant Glen Farkless, the owner of Glen Farkless. Um, he is absolutely adamant and absolutely, um, um, uh, he will never allow, if any independent bottler re re releases a, 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 bo a bottling of Glen Farkless um, and reveals it to be Glen Farkless, he will sue them. He will sue them consistently, you know? And he's, the, he's really the only one. I mean, McCallum, for example, they let it go, but, um, but John, and so, once he was in the in the in the in the uh, members' room in in Leith in Edinburgh, uh, in the vaults, and um, he found a list of the revealing the the numbers and the distilleries on the bar, and he was absolutely incandescent because, of course, number one, Glen Farkless, so people could find out. In those days, it was it was, and I mean, well, the, the he was absolutely furious and, and nearly went to law. To, to to have it um, but now of course the with the internet and all that you you there's nothing we can do about it so anyway the bottling the the numbers continue um out of 
to the to the to the to the, to the brand owners. Um, anyway, so back to the looking at this. So we so as a panel, we look first of all at the color. As you know, the color tells you a lot about about the the way it's been matured. This is a a, 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 a sort of golden color, which would suggest to me that it's come from a um, a refill American oak hogshead. Um, because you you wouldn't the, the the one I'm looking at is 20 years old. I think your, yours is 17, I think, isn't it? The uh, and I assume that it's the, yours yours looks slightly darker actually. But, yeah. it's, it's, but we're still looking at the same width. It's a Glen Scotia, um, right. and the um, but mine mine is certainly for refill American oak. Uh, um, they tend to talk about refill bourbon, refill sherry, or or first fill sherry, first fill um, bourbon. This is somewhat inaccurate. You should be really looking at the whether whether it's American oak or whether it's European oak. European oak gives a much deeper color. Um, I've got this bottle in front of me. You see, that's that is more that this actually will have been will have been colored up. So it's a bit of a but, but that that's more the sort of color you would expect from European oak. Um, and this golden color is what you'd expect from American oak. And the um, um, so we look at the color. Then I always encourage them to look at the beading. Do you see how it foams like that? Can you see that? This is called beading, the beading test. And the beading test, it, it tells you, see how it's lingering there? Can you see the little bubbles lingering? Mm -hmm. that, that is what I would describe as a moderate bead only. If I was to take this one, which is, do you see, it doesn't bead at all. It just you see it fizzes and disappears yeah. and yeah um, um so that what the what that is telling me is that the whiskey you don't get a bead under about 50 percent alcohol so the obviously the society's bottlings are all down at cast strength so they're going to be they're going to be many of them you know uh, uh, many of them at 50 percent um obviously they can come down they can still be sold as whiskey um, until they hit 40%. If they go under 40%, they can no longer be sold as Scotch whiskey. And I think that's the same true with bourbon. The same, same is true with bourbon. You can't sell it as such under 40% alcohol. Um, but so if you get a good bead like that, it tells you A, that it's, 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 um, it's over 50%. Uh, my one here is 54.8. Um, the, the, but also it tells you something about the way it's been matured. Because if it if the bead lingers, it's an indication that it's got some um, barrel age. It's been matured for 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 a reasonable length of time in the, in the in the cask. So it's a very useful it's a very useful ready ready reckoner. It's setting up expectation. Because if it, if it is if if you know when I'm looking at whiskey's completely blind, judging competition, I will always even even just shake shake it in the glass. And that tells me, yep, that's beading. So therefore, um, I will add water to it to bring it down to a palatable. I'll taste it straight, and the but bring it down to a palatable, palatable strength. So that's the first thing. Appearance, first thing. Nose, nose straight without. Um, and when you, you're, the first thing you comment on on the nose is what's called the nose feel effect. Um, the physical effect that the the whiskey is having now um, being being relatively high strength being natural strength the uh, this is mild it's not obvious it's not in your face but it's also quite prickly and you can think of nose feel as being nose cooling nose warming but typically prickly um, um, and prickle, prickle tends to come from the alcoholic strength, but it, there are some whiskies, notably someone uh, like, like Tarasca, for example, um, which is peppery by you know by 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 design. So, so if, if I was writing notes or talking to the panel, I would say, right, what nose feel effect? And this is quite mellow, but it's also quite prickly. And then you start unpacking what you think you are smelling, what the smells remind you of. Um, writing tasting notes is, is always elusive, you know, you know, 
you may think you get oranges. They're not really oranges, but it kind of reminds you of oranges. You know? In this case, what am I getting here? The top, I, I, I like to think in terms of like a perfumer, top notes, mid notes, and bass note. And the top note here is very faintly pastry. It's 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 the it's it's quite difficult to smell because it's 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 quite quite prickly. So I, I imagine that when I add water, it'll it'll come up. But top note at, at, at natural strength. It's very it's faintly vanilla, and that's again American oak. Um, so I'm thinking vanilla custard, and I'm thinking. Vanilla sponge, vanilla sponge, sponge cake. And then beneath that um, are notes of the kind of maritime, um, by which I mean, uh, well, crystalline salt, um, you know, sea, sea breeze, if you like. Um, very very light very light at an extreme maritime notes embrace you know seaweed rotting seaweed um um an iodine um and then going right through to medicinal phenols you know kind of uh, creosote um the sort of things you find in 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 isla isla the extreme isla whiskies this is very very mild so now I'm going to taste straight. Um, so I'm going to taste it straight. I, I would usually have a glass of water. In fact, I'll have a slug of my. Um, actually, I'll have a slug of this whiskey. Just to to coat <laughs> my. Palate. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing better than prepping your palate. With it. <laughs> like resetting your whiskey palate with some whiskey. <laughs> and then taste it right now. Perfect. No, no, Ben. Should we uh, should should we comment on on what we're smelling here? Or yeah, right. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I think um, I don't know. Should obviously, we go yeah, but I thought we'll see where we're going to talk. But but maybe Charlie, just to kind of just to, if you, I would say go ahead and conclude sort of the your process. I think this is really helpful. Okay. And okay. then okay. and then we'll go into the the and then the, we'll 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 yeah. 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 Now, when you taste straight and take a little sip, and you're looking at the. The, it's what's called the balance of primary tastes. So, sweetness tends to be picked up. There are four. There are five primary tastes: sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Umami is um, loosely speaking savoury. Um, so, sweetness tends to be picked up towards the front of the tongue. Saltiness and acidity at the sides of the tongue. The, the, the receptors are um, mingled. Then that you don't have salt and vinegar one side and another, but the and then sour at the back. Dry wine term, um, tannic is basically tannic, um, is also at the back. It's not a primary taste. And smokiness also at the back as you swallow, not a primary taste. But the, so when you take a little sip, hold it in your mouth for, for longer than you usually, usually would. And see, think what part of your palate your tongue and, and soft palate, uh, um, what parts are being stimulated. Um, so this has got, so let's try this again. Yeah. What I forgot to mention, you also comment on the texture, the mouthfeel effect. This is oily. Mine is certainly is oily. You've got creamy, oily, or it might be acerbic. You know, it might be quite um, mouth drying right from the start. Um, it might be thin, um, but that's got a, this has got a nice body. It's got a nice mouth feel, um, and I've described it, I think probably as oily rather than creamy. Um, the primary taste there is a very light sweetness. There's a distinct saltiness, distinct saltiness. Um, and then it dries, it dries in the in the in the in the finish as you swallow. Um, so it's got it's it's displaying a nice balance of these of these different tastes. 
Now, let's add a wee bit of water. I rather effectively use the pipette thing. And, the, and what we're trying to do is to add enough to take off the uh, of the prickle to op open it up the that's the never be shy of adding water to whiskey the uh um well particularly particularly scotch malt um and i i always say when i'm doing these tastings around the world the uh i mean you know for 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 drinking that, that a tumbler is fine you know for appreciation it's it is frankly essential to have a glass where the rim narrows slightly so as to concentrate the aroma because when you for appreciation you smell before you taste um that's it's so important that and the the um so well, that is some water now enough i hope to have taken off the prickle yep and open it up now it's become more maritime that that um that vanilla pastry note has disappeared and it's become very likely um it says it's a gentle sort of um sort of not it's it's really a scottish beach rather than a than than, than, a, than, a, than, a, than a than a scorching hot uh, american beach so i can smell sand warm warm sand even dunes you know like it comes to mind you know but there's the, there's the, this maritime this 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 sort of um salty salt salty air surrounding it yeah. i'm trying to look for fruits in this i'm not getting much fruit of this out of this the maybe white grapes and now at the base note there is perhaps a just a hint of smoke or you know, distant bonfire, or um, you know, kind of an, an extinguished, an extinguished um, fire, wood fire. Okay, so now we taste, and now this time, hold it for for considerably longer in the mouth because we're more comfortable. Um, and think of those primary tastes. Mm. Mm, delicious. Um, it's 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 even more oily. Funnily enough, very nice texture. Um, it's 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 slightly sweeter. It's slightly saltier, and now there's a sort of a um, fizzy note across the tongue. Um, I mean, in wine terms, that would be called spritzig, or, 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 or what they, what's the French term for it then? It's like it's like it's slightly sherbety, you know, like like um, uh, what are those sweeties that they have? Um, um, but they're based on sherbet, and so it's slightly fizzy across the tongue. It's not quite so dry uh, in the finish, and the it's a it's a very it's a pleasant, clean, straightforward, relatively short finish. There we are. So backing up and sort of segueing into. You know, obviously, this U.S. exclusive cast is 93.140. Maybe to tell them, you know, since you were um, jetting Charlie all over the country last year, let's break down to sort of this. This is the first time we had done this, and, and the, this this U.S. exclusive cast is, is unique to any other that we've had because it was, in fact, chosen by our members here in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, so only release. And so, um, Tom, do you want to kind of just highlight the, the format of that? I know I'm going through the comments that, you know, uh, sure. Yeah, some the, when they were there, and, and let's kind of oh, great. Maybe into maybe because I'm sort of nosing and tasting this, and I'm ready to just drink the damn thing. And so let's let's yeah, get to the yeah. you know. fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. So the the idea at the onset was to empower our members um, around the, the country to to basically choose their own casks while getting a, a real feel for what the tasting panel experience is all about. The, the, the tasting panel is very unique to the uh, society proposition for members. Um, anyone can release a single cask, but we're releasing single casks that have been vetted 
by Charlie and, and his pals who are who just happen to be some of the brightest minds in the scotch industry. So, you know, when we're sitting at home kind of going through the website, uh, that's that's a that's a great thing for it's a really nice confidence that we can have as members to, to know that these whiskeys have been properly vetted and, and described to us in, in such poetic and, and sometimes really far out uh, language. Um, anyway, we wanted to bring that to the members and thus uh, we decided to do this in, in the major cities. Um, and the, um, you know, the, the sort of protocol was, was pretty bare bones. Um, if you come to a society tasting, usually it's oftentimes blind. There's some food and stuff about, uh, this was much earlier. It was about 5 PM in each city, um, because we wanted to make sure people didn't have too, too much to eat yet. Uh, we wanted their palates to be, you know, as, as ready to go as possible. Um, and we also wanted time to go to the bar afterwards. So there's that. Um, but but essentially you show up and there's no food, nowhere. It's, it's very classroom style. Uh, the whiskeys were pre-poured. Um, but aside from that, you know, it's really just people examining um, with, you know, the proper, in the proper environment really to assess whiskey like they do at, at the tasting panel um, experiences in the UK. I mean, the, in the UK, they're usually meeting um, earlier in the morning, 8.30, 9 a.m., obviously, on a weekday, that's a little tough for people, uh, but uh, but you know they want their palates to be fresh, and there are no there's no olives or cheese or crackers or anything. There um, there really is just whiskey and water on the table, so that's what we did. Um, so you know we tasted through under Char Charlie's uh, guidance, I tasted through all of all of these whiskeys together, and um, members filled out uh, tasting sheets. Uh, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, the nose neat, the palate neat, uh, the nose diluted, and the palate diluted. Um, and they submitted these. They also were um, encouraged to submit uh, some, some names that they, they thought uh, would be appropriate. And, um, and yeah, so we, I collected all of these notes and assessed all of the individual scores that, that people gave. And uh, out of six whiskeys, uh, six samples, I should say, that had yet to be bottled. Um, it was the job of the members under Charlie's guidance to decide which of these casks were most ready for release. Um, so the one we are featuring today and, and currently have a lucky draw going on for was the one that scored highest uh, of all six. And that's cask 93.140. So that's, that's basically, um, you know, kind of how the tasting itself went that that lasted about two hours um except in new york i think we went maybe three hours charlie was very chatty but it was amazing um and then after that we retired to the bar and we drank society whiskey and charlie you know told more tales and and, and just regaled us with uh you know with a lot of interesting and and uh, thought-provoking information um so it was it was really uh, a, a dream kind of roadshow for, for me, for sure. And, and I think can, can I pick up on that? There yeah. the, the were two very important things that you mentioned. The, fa the fact that we were tasting relatively early and without all sorts of crackers and stuff. Um, the, um, when you really to do a proper evaluation, you, you've got to do it a bit before lunch, you know, um, mm -hmm. because when, you're, when, you're, when you're whole, your, your, your senses are all fresh, first thing. But the second thing, and the most interesting thing for me, was that in all the tastings that we did, and was it five? Was it five or six tastings that we did? It's five. Yeah. And the and the and then we, and and I, I I as I do with the with the panel in 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 Edinburgh, um, I asked them. I never I never go public on scores. Never ever go public on scores. But privately, I score out of ten, and I always invite the panel to score the whiskey out of, out of 10. And we did the same thing in, 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 with, 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 with you. And the, ex, the extraordinary interesting thing was that all the five groups, all the five panels scored the ones that we had previously scored highest um, um, before, 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 before with, and without being led. I mean, I was very careful about not That's leading. Right. Um, and the uh, 
But the, 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 the three whiskies that we scored highest out of the six were the ones that your members um, chose. And that was absolutely fascinating for me because they are, some of them be experienced, some of them are rank amateurs, but they got it right, you know. Or, uh, That's um, right. Very the, consistent. The, it was extraordinarily consistent and yeah. very, very interesting. And I think that the message you learn is to, 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 to use your own, your own judgment, you know, because it's probably going to be right, you know. Um, right. Our members have great taste. It's it's yeah. really yeah. all that you've said about that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, I, I remember being so impressed by all six, and, and I, you always ask yourself, "Well, Charlie, you were here. It was great here, and you did that influence my experience tasting the whiskey?" Sort of in the in the same way when you walk into a distillery, a whiskey in the warehouse after going on the tour tends to taste yeah, 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 yeah. I think you were all phenomenal. And I think the scoring, yes, this was the highest, received the highest score. But it was pretty close, if, if I remember. Very close. I think across the board. A tenth of a point. A tenth yeah. of a point between them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. They were, they were, they, they were close. But the, the ones that were fractionally better in, in our, and right. when, I, when I noticed them here with you and Campbell um, before coming to you, um, the ones that we had scored highest fractionally. I mean, you're talking about, you know, six and a half rather than seven, and or five and a half rather than six. You know, the very slight um, differences. But but the your the members, um, your members, you know, chose exactly the ones that we had scored highest, and they weren't given any guidance on that, none whatsoever. Really, very. very I found it really, really interesting. The um, that the um, um, yeah the pop, vox populi the the you know the the, the popular taste was 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 uh, coincided with the so-called experts' taste you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you yeah. should Come probably know it too, don't you think? So so this is obviously a cast ninety three point one four zero, and and we've announced this, but bacon on a bonfire. Uh, I saw a comment about the name. This was in fact named by a member, right? We did ask everybody to submit names. Actually. Actually, yeah, it was. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was named. It was named by me. I'm sorry. No, really? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I gave Charlie a list of names, and I tossed that into into the hat, and it was it was me. Wow. There is there is actually one. There is actually one um, cast that was. You know, we did this all genuinely, like that. We were all blinding each other and everything. So. Yeah. Um, you know, there there was one cast that was chosen uh, by an actual member in the uh, at one of the tastings. There's one cast. Yeah. This is not it. I'm well, very I'm sorry. Now, we are now discounting this bottle by twenty dollars each because uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's a no. But but listen, I, I think you know we've seen in the society members here in the U.S. We've seen a tremendous surge in interest for Campbelltown whiskey. Um, we've done a lot from Distillery Ninety Three here, and so. Um, this is, in fact, not our first U.S. exclusive from the distillery. We did a pick uh, last year. Not the members pick, but we picked one from 93. Um, Boiling Coastal has been just, I, I, again, I, I think, you know, it's interesting. We saw that the scoring, it was close. But when we look back on our back end in our online shop, a lot of members are searching for 93 dot, you, you know, all the time. Charlie, what, what do you make of Campbelltown and just overall? Tom and I actually had a chance. We were there together last year. Um, what, what do you think? I mean, what's your take on the region, the whiskey? Um, the style as you well, were explaining, the one in your glasses. I tell you, Ben, the, the um, Campbelltown, as, 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 as I'm sure you're aware, um, was once the whiskey capital of Scotland. And it had something like 32 distilleries at one time. I think in the 1880s, there were 32 distilleries in, in Campbelltown. It went into severe decline. Um, very difficult to know exactly why the <clears throat> the Campbelltown distillers didn't take advantage of um, prohibition. Um, they started to ship out to the U.S. during prohibition during the 1920s. Um, um, dare I say it? Inferior product. Um, um, the 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 a lot of the major um, blending companies um, they. They had a thing called the secret agreement, and the U.S. government was 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 pressing the the the, the British government to put a stop to this because, of course, it was perfectly legal 
to ship product whiskey to Canada or to the Bahamas or to Mexico or to or, you know, off like but, but particularly particularly the the West Indies um, offline countries and what happened after that that, that all well, that was perfectly legal what happened after that they didn't want to know and so it was bootlegged in to the um, to, to mainland um, America US um, but the secret agreement was with, with, with all the major um, blenders um, required the, for people to sign up, the, the members to sign up, to make sure that the product was of good quality. Don't sell them shit, you know. Uh, make sure it was sold at a reasonable price, and as far as possible, don't deal with the mob, you know. And of course, the mob really came in when it was when it was um, shipped. Um, um, bootlegged in and so as a result during prohibition scotch won a terrific following a terrific following in in in, in the u.s um the american distillers were were of course very severely constrained because it was all banned um but they could be busted easily um you had these phenomena phenomena like like bathtub gin so-called um, rise in cocktails to disguise the the, the the hideous flavors of some of the spirits that were available. But scotch was r reliable, you know. And it was very canny of the, the, the scotch whiskey distillers because they they knew that it couldn't last forever. And when it was repealed in 33, um, the demand for scotch whiskey in, in the U.S. was, was un un unbelievable, you know. Indeed, prior to prior to about 1938 the um, the leading export market for scotch was Australia but but after that it was the US and has remained the same ever since you know um, so the the, the 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 foundations of the success of scotch whiskey um, really is is is, the, is is it was were laid in during prohibition now the the Irish distillers and indeed Campbelltown, the Irish distillers wouldn't play that game. But, um, I think they had closer relations with the um, the American government and the the, the nascent, you know, the, the Republic um, of Ireland, and so Irish distilling went into a, in a precipitous um, decline thereafter. Um, and um, um, Campbelltown, it's supposed to be that they were selling, they, they were offering rubbish, and the uh, I, I'm not sure that's the case to be honest, but the I think that they were killed largely by the um, Speyside distillers because Campbelltown, which had been, as I say, the, 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 the whiskey capital, um, but uh, during the 1890s, there were many, many distilleries built on Speyside because they supplied this light, sweet style of whiskey, which was attracted for, 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 for blending purposes. Um, and Campbelltown whiskies were highly variable um they were um some of them were very smoky some of them were but they they they, they were they were variable and so gradually they um they petered out and but by, by um by 1930 there were three distilleries only three operating in Campbelltown, and one of them died in 1932 um uh, with and leaving two Glen Scotia and Springbank. Now, Glen Scotia has had a very checkered um, history since then. Uh, Springbank has kept 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 going. Springbank is the only distillery, well, one of only th let's say three that is still in the ownership of the founding family, um, the Mitchells um, in Springbank's case. The the uh, um, then Fiddick um, and Balveni, the, the, the grants are still, but they, of course that's a massive corporation now. Um, and the only other one is of, of, the, of the, the, the the old established facilities is um, is Glen Farkas, still owned by the grants of Glen Farkas. Um, the rest are all gone through various hands and corporations and so on. So, but this, the 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 style, this the the Campbelltown style is frankly grubby it's not clean whiskey 
It's got these maritime overtones. It's got these CBD things. Um, um, I mean, old old Springbank is as good as as good as it possibly gets. Um, then Scotia went through all sorts of changes, but in the current ownership, um, they they've really they spent an awful lot of money on the distillery itself. It's a very pretty place now. Indeed, Campbelltown has really come up. Um, it was a dirty old wee town, we fishing fishing village, really fishing town, and the um, but that's really really come up. Um, um, uh, so Glen Scotia is much much improved. Um, if you're buying in a liquor store, I would go for um, the Glen Scotia Victoriana, which is a mix of casks and. I don't think it's got even an age statement on it, but it's a one lovely, lovely whiskey, and the um, um, Victoriana. Um, uh, Springbank is is variable as it always was, but old Springbank is divine, absolutely divine. You know the the uh, uh, let, let's say Springbank, whatever age, um, but m m particularly made um, made say thirty years ago, but not necessarily. I mean, it, at auction, for example, if you can pick up a Springbank, ten years old Springbank, um, I so, sorry, am I, am I I'm going on too long? I think the the uh, but that's the, fine. The, the one of my, my one of my gurus is um, Sukinder Singh. Sukinder owns the um, the whiskey exchange um, in London, which is the leading independent, you know. Um, sort of an off trade outlet he also has i think the almost certainly the best collection of whiskies in the uk um i mean outstanding and he, he's a sikh he's got a, he's got a bloody turban and stuff you know um absolutely brilliant guy and the um uh, and knows more about whiskey than 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 any of us you know and, and old old bottles and new bottles anyway once I was I was I was flying to South Africa, and um, my flight was delayed by four hours. I was at Heathrow Airport, and his offices at that time were were where his warehouse was not that far, about three stops on the on the tube from Heathrow. So I phoned him and I said, he, "I'm stuck here." He says, "I'll send a car. Get off at such and such a, a, a station. I'll send the car. Bring you down. We'll we'll have some supper." Well, I tell you what, we ne we never had supper, but we we, we tasted <laughs> some amazing whiskies, and uh, and we got on to talking about the whole business of scoring. As I said earlier on, I never I never go public on scores. I think it, I think it's iniquitous, really, to go public on scores. Um, but the uh, and he agreed, and and he said, "Have you ever come across a, a, a ten out of ten? And I said, "No, Sukinda, um, ten out of ten is only found in heaven." You know, um, he said, I think I may be able to show you one. And he went off and he brought a bottle of Springbank, 10 year old Springbank, screw top, you know, made in the, uh, it, 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 it was made in the, I think it was bottled in about 1975. So it was made in the 1960s. And the, um, opened this bottle. And I tell you what, it was a 10 year old, very ordinary, 40% alcohol, you know, a very ordinary bottle. And it was as good. I mean, I I, I still maintain that the ten out of ten is only found in heaven. But the God, it was about it would be about nine point five, you know, nine point five, nine point seven. You know, it was as close as it got. Yeah. You know? So these old spring banks um, are just amazing. But even the the contemporary spring banks, um, they do need a bit of age. Um, young spring bank, I find rather coarse. But the the uh, Older spring banks are um, wonderful whiskies. So I mean, I, I'm, 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 I have a very high regard for both. And the, the third distillery now, which which Mitchell's the the owners of Springbank, um, they restored what is it called? Uh, Dengile. Yeah, Dengile. That's right. Uh, that's s still very young, and so it doesn't really have the. Uh, I haven't really tasted that much Dengile, but it doesn't really have the the um, Campbelltown character but it's it's a I mean it, I, I, I get asked you know, I get approached for, by people oh we've got a client who wants to buy a distillery build a distillery etc etc 
and the I say wait, wait for at least five years because there'll be a lot of distilleries on the market who won't the, the new distilleries that have set up and they can't they can't they can't survive. But if they were really serious, if I were if I were building a distillery or investing in building a distillery, I would build in in in, in Campbelltown, the because uh, it's got this huge historical reputation. And if you could, if you, and there, 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 there are gap sites all over the place where in the wee town, um, and they call it the wee, the wee tune, the wee tune, and the people from Campbelltown are called Toonies, um, and the, um, but the, but you know, you could find a site and build a distillery there, and which had a previous distillery on it, um, and it would give you, it would give you a start, you know. The, uh, Anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. I'm rambling. No, well, listen. Well, Tom and I had a we, we drove from Edinburgh last year uh, with with you and Campbell. The three of us went, and we had such a phenomenal time there. It was the, it was the first time we had both been to Campbelltown, and, and spent a very short amount of time. But I think we in that short it amount of time did everything you need to see. Glorious, glorious twenty four hours. The fact that we sort of questionable sure. on the survival, uh, you know, whether we did or not. But but it was uh, it was fantastic. And, and yeah, yeah. Consumed as much whiskey as we needed to consume, or could possibly humanly consume. I don't know. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps you would push the, the bar a little bit higher, but uh, prepping your palate for whiskey with whiskey. But I, you know, I think it was uh, is phenomenal. And so this one, Tom. I mean, do you want to kind of just alluded to, to this one particular, or your thoughts on this, Tom? Oh, I, can't, yeah. I, can't, I can't remember because the 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 it, the it was the it was the one that, that that scored highest. I think wasn't it, Tom? This is, yeah, yeah this is the one, yeah, for sure. Um, 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 I mean, both pre and indeed during the, the, the tour. Um, I'm, I'm, right. I'm taking a different one, so ignore all my thoughts, but the, because this is different whiskey. Um, yeah, full, uh, full disclosure, we had we wanted to get some, uh, some of these samples to, to Charlie for today's uh, viewing. Uh, however, the pandemic has gotten in the way of the international shipping for us, so... Um, yeah. So yeah, so Charlie's uh, sipping a, a lovely twenty-year-old Blend Scotia, but yeah. uh, also, I mean, natural strength. So that's nice. Mm -hmm. This also uh, cast ninety-three point one four zero is natural strength at fifty-five point nine percent. Spent all seventeen years in a second fill, ex bourbon barrel. And uh, Charlie, you were mentioning the color earlier, right? and I think based on this color, we can assume it was a fairly active barrel. Yeah, and you bet. I mean, a gorgeous hit of vanilla. Um, from, from what I can see, it's, it's it's darker than my one here. Yeah, yeah um, for sure. Yeah. Now I'm nosing. I'm nosing diluted here from the Glencairn, and I have undiluted in the Copita. And earlier, when I first started nosing, I got this really beautiful sort of resinous, almost a touch of sarsaparilla or something like that before oh. before the the little bits of uh of smoke started coming through and that you know, what you were talking about earlier about a coastal breeze or the maritime or what i oftentimes call salinity um you know that, that core really carries through the entire nose and you certainly i get a lot of that vanilla you were talking about As far as fruits, more orchard fruits. If I'm going to pull them out, but I feel like, I feel like the nose is really rather savory and lovely in, in that regard. Yeah, I mean, double fisting at twelve yeah, o'clock. Not bad. I, I, I do. You know, when we were out there, Tom, and, and really had a chance to you know, did the warehouse tours and tastings, and and. You know, it's interesting because from Campbellton, you, you do have the different variants of malt at different peating levels, and and I think with the Silver ninety three in its own, you have a variety of you know you know heavily peated. Right. And, this, and this is and this one is really kind of the more the traditional style the distillery, which is that's right. Which I understand, which is technically unpeated, but I, I believe there is like a little bit of peat. Yeah. It's typically unpeated. They they do different runs, and um, yeah. and when they're peating. It's really only about fifteen to twenty parts per million. So you're you're not talking about a vast amount of peat here, um, but uh, so, so it's coming through in a very elegant way. You know, it's it's not, certainly not yeah. clobbering you over the head or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I, I just remember the first time we tasted it blind, you know, when you were here, Charlie, in the States, not knowing what it was, that I, I picked up a lot of peat. And you know, the name Bacon on the Bonfire just it connected because that's exactly what I picked up. Today, for some reason, I, the, the, the smoke or any influence of the smoke is really on the back end. And I'm getting a lot of sort of creamy vanillas and a bit of shellfish. Right. Um, and, and it's really, really fun. For me today. The smokiness, the smokiness really builds as it as it sits in the in the glass. So I'm going back now to the diluted whiskey, and it's getting much much smokier on the nose. And it's also really interesting. Now this was October, but I I felt like this whiskey was still very fresh in my mind from the events that we did. It's it's I think a very different situation to taste today, having not tasted anything else yet. This was the first thing we tasted versus in the context of those events, we had already tasted through four expressions, right. you know, two, right. three unpeated, one heavily sherried, you know, another that was lightly peated. So, you know, it's, it's a very, it's a very different journey. I think um, a sensory journey when you're, when you're tasting in all of those whiskeys in the same sitting versus yeah. just this, you know? Yeah. And of course yeah. it's always going to benefit with, time in the glass so patience always yeah pays yeah, off yeah 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 no absolutely absolutely uh, but yeah it, really gorgeous as you know i do i do um or oh, i have done over the last oh god man, that, so, oh, 10 years yeah, i suppose nearly 10 years a lot of work in china which is a a a, a big um you know potential market um relatively new to scotch um, but growing. And of course, they tend to drink, well, first of all, they drink spirits with, with food. They don't, and they don't analyze. It's, it's, it's very much sort of, um, campe, with campe, which means down the hatch, you know, um, bottoms up, you know, and the, um, so they don't, they don't think about it, just down the hatch. And I try and draw their attention to, this is following on from what you were saying, give it time. But of course, there's a huge culture, tea culture, of uh, in China, um, where they go into you know, ridiculous, from to my mind, um, the, the the whole the, it's, 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 well, they call it tea ceremony, and I mean it's just the way of making tea and uh, diluting it and so on, and then and then appreciating it and thinking about it and talking about it and very very meditative, you know. And I, 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 I try and encourage them to, to draw a parallel between, you know, appreciating whiskey and appreciating tea. Now I don't know whether 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 it goes down at all well, but the, uh, the, the it seems to me to be a logical or, or a useful parallel because I mean these whiskies have been made with great great care and matured for a very long time, um, and they've got all sorts of stories behind them, and. Uh, they are worthy. They reward contemplation, you know, and the um, and that's why the whole business about nosing and tasting and all that sort of stuff, rather than just you know, down the hatch, you know, sort of uh, campaign and the down it goes and the. Uh, um, but no, it, 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 time in the glass, it it it, it 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 alters all the time, doesn't it? And the um, um, absolutely. I mean, that's what that's what this is all about. This appreciation, uh, this discovery of. Of flavors, you know. I mean, yeah. it only comes with a little bit yeah. of patience, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. just just to wrap up, I mean, on this bottle in particular, I know because there's a lot of interest, and of course, we we announced this uh, two days ago to all of our members here. We, you know, the the during this, I mean, Charlie, during the the pandemic, um, obviously everybody forced to be at home. We've seen just a surge in interest, obviously, in our whiskeys too, simply because it's convenient to, to you know, be, you, know, you can, you don't have to leave your home to get the whiskeys. Um, so just to, just to let you all know, if you haven't noticed already or, or seen the announcement, we are offering this one in a uh, form of a lottery drawing for a chance to purchase. And, and so typically when we release our whiskeys, it's a first come first serve basis. But just knowing that we've seen such a, an increase in interest just to have for, so everyone has a fair chance. It is available on lottery. I've included a link below if you guys haven't seen that already, um, just for a chance to enter. We are closing it tonight at midnight, and then you'll have you'll be those who are selected randomly um, will be contacted. And Tom, what is it? Just under two hundred bottles, I think total, right from from this cask. 
That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. There yeah. were, it was 198 in the in the outturn. Of course, we had to use a few of those for um, initial assessment, and then a few of those samples were taken out of the barrel for the events last year. So um, about a, about 100 and, 180 and change um, available. So there there will be a lot of happy members. Not uh, of course, we're dealing with finite single casks that that is that is what we do at the society so you know there's only so much of of, of each cask um yeah. so for those of you who are not lucky enough to get your name drawn just know that we will be releasing two more of these tasting panel experience casks um in the course of 2020 and hopefully charlie if you're not too busy maybe you can join us for those, <laughs> I, for those as well i mean i do hope so i do I hope, oh, right. I, I, hope, I hope so physically rather than virtually, but the- uh, That would be amazing. Yeah. And uh, not. Yeah, we're, hoping, yeah. we're hoping to maybe take this uh, show back on the road um, November of this year, but it's looking at, looking like that might have to get pushed a bit further with the oh, current well, whenever, environment. Whenever, whenever. Of yeah. course, fingers crossed, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully be, uh, be back up and running soon. But, um, but we, we do hope you can at least join us virtually from your- Beautiful library for the next. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah. next year. Yeah. No, no problem at all. Great, great. But at least the comforting thing, Tom, is that I understand that that sales of brown spirits in the U.S. have increased by twenty-seven percent. That the, the the whether that I don't think that's necessarily Scotch only, but it'll be bourbon and rye and so on. But brown spirits, twenty-seven um, percent. So the during during this grisly lockdown period. Um, people are continuing to drink at least, you know. The, the, well, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe, yeah. maybe now a little more than you know in in other times. But <laughs> we've heard from, we've heard from a lot of members that, that they're so happy that they get to you know pour themselves a, a uh, side yeah. grab at the end of their workday because you know yeah. when you're working from home all day, you know, especially yeah. me in like a, a small New York City apartment, they yeah. <laughs> you have to find, yeah. find creative ways to to discern work from you know, uh, you know, regular life. And so that's, that's usually in the form of a, of a dram or a highball for me. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I but, reward myself at 11 o'clock with a glass of sherry, 12 o'clock with a glass of gin. Um, and then when I have lunch, I may have a glass of wine and then at six o'clock whiskey. You, the, and, so I, 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 little rewards you know, throughout, throughout the day. And that's why you're going to live forever. I mean, that's that's, that's the secret well, to immortality. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think guys were on YouTube. I had seen a video on YouTube where someone tried to emulate Winston Churchill's daily consumption habits. I mean, if you read about his, I mean, he had you know a bottle of champagne at lunch. You know, I I, I can't remember. I, there's a video out there that's somewhere that's hilarious, and he tries to do that for a, one day, I think, and he really struggles. You know. Uh, so that's very uh, funny. We, he, 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 Churchill is my model. I think we, or, or, or my, my, if I need, if I, if I've got a bad conscience, he didn't like tea, and I'm not a great fan of tea. Um, I drink coffee all morning, but the I don't really like tea. But he substituted Johnny Walker Black Label for tea in the in, in the late afternoon. He would have you know, a large Johnny Walker Black Label with with probably soda, I imagine, in those days. But the uh, but I, I haven't yet um, resorted to that. But the the, the the late afternoon, but after six o'clock, yeah, large blended scotch with water. Yeah. I come in here. So, so, guys, just before I forget, um, I know we're we're probably wrapping up the broadcast very shortly. But but before I forget, I just want to thank all the members who were a part of this last year, um, who were able to come out to uh, New York, D.C., Chicago. Seattle, Los Angeles, and spend some time with us and get to meet Charlie and provide your input to these whiskeys. I mean, obviously, the whole point was to get you included. And, and we thank you so much for your efforts and thank you um, in helping us create these wonderful casks that a lot of members now get to enjoy. So those of you who do win these uh, these bottles, or at least win the opportunity to order, I should be clear, um, just be sure to share it with your fellow member as much as you can and, and spread the love around. So, so thanks to everybody out there.
Yeah, I think, Charlie, you probably met about, I think it was about 150 members here in the States of the five cities came together, for, you know, for the voting. Right. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And so there was a lot. And I, I have to say, I mean, the, the membership here has just been, it's been growing very quickly. The enthusiasm is amazing. And I think just so we, we've shared this, I've explained this in the past, but as we continue to grow, we, our plan is to continue offering more experiences, you know, like the chance of Charlie to meet, to meet you and, and participate in a cast pick. Um, obviously, of course, the pandemic has, has slowed this down, but just to be here even virtually has been phenomenal. So we're looking always to continue to expand the opportunities again. Paul. It's been absolutely great. It really has, it really has been great. Mm. Well, um, Charlie, Tom, stick around for a moment. I'm gonna just end this. Again, thank you all. Best of luck to everybody who's entered the drawing for 93140, Bacon on a Bonfire, which we just learned was actually named by Tom. Um, so <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to anybody. Let me just let me just clear that up real quick. I submitted about ten different notable titles yeah, to yeah. Charlie. There was only one title in there that I wrote. And I threw in the hat, like threw threw my hat and ring on, and he just has impeccable taste. What can I say? It's, 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 it's a great name in America. Everybody loves bacon. We love a good bacon. I, mean, I love bacon. Bacon is that I'm like the Churchill of bacon consumption. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Best of luck and Slon. Great. Great. Thanks, Glenn. That's Glenn. Thanks. Slon to Charlie. Thanks, man.